Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now in this box we have one of the cheapest brand new pre-built PCs available to buy here in the UK. This Zenta PC is available at ebuyer.com who I have worked with previously but this time I bought it with my own hard-earned cash. Today we'll be taking a closer look at this system talking about the build quality components and the upgrade potential before upgrading it on a very tight budget. I paid £169.69 plus £6.99 for next day delivery for this brand new build and annoyingly a couple of days after I did this a cheaper £149.49 model appeared. As far as I can tell there isn't any difference spec wise but the case design looks a little different in the pictures. There's also another £150 system with a lower power version of the processor used here. Upgrading the UK's second cheapest pre-built doesn't have the same ring to it for a title so I'll probably rethink that. I've also kept the specs a secret for now just to add to the suspense a little bit. Now Zenta PCs are built in the UK and aim to deliver no frills reliability at affordable prices. There's a 3 year warranty included as well which is nice to see especially at this price point. I really like the lightweight compact design of this model. I can certainly picture a few of these lined up on a desk in an office. At the front we have 4 USB ports, 2 of which are USB 3 and 2 audio jacks. There's no DVD drive which I mean I expect these days. Around the back we have more USB ports an ethernet connection, audio jacks as well as VGA and HDMI. We get a USB Wi-Fi dongle thrown in as well. Opening up the Zenta machine reveals the hardware and I thought everything would be far more tightly packed in here. There's a small form factor PSU which leaves a lot of room at the bottom of the case and the PCIe slot on the motherboard is exposed for easy upgradability. I think Zenta have certainly made the most of this small space. I did wonder where the SSD was at first but it turns out that popping the front panel off, removing a screw and lifting up this little metal door flap thingy reveals all. Now I can't imagine many buyers are going to be tinkering around in here nor will they be buying these for anything other than basic computing but it's nice to know everything is easily accessible for upgrade or maintenance purposes. Speaking of upgrades I wouldn't recommend buying one of these specifically to upgrade it for say gaming. It makes far more sense to build a gaming focused system from scratch. The question here though is can we rather than should we? Well we've got a pretty good place to start. This is an AM4 based build which currently has an A69500 CPU, 8 gigs of 3200MHz DDR4, a 240GB SSD and a Biostar A320MH 2.0 motherboard which supports all the latest and greatest AM4 processors though the website does state that performance may be limited due to the power phase design. In other words, probably best not to slap a 5900X in here. Our budget is way tighter than that anyway. As it is, there is no OS, but I think this would work really well with a lightweight version of Linux. On first boot, the system took a straight into the BIOS where I couldn't set the RAM speed any higher than 2400MHz. This is the highest the A6 CPU officially supports, so it's nice that we do have faster stuff included for the sake of any CPU upgrades. During my week or so with this PC, I've installed Windows 10 and used it for basic tasks, which it handled just fine fine. The SSD certainly helps with the boot times and the loading. I definitely thought the experience would feel more sluggish as the A6 is a two core chip but this really is a no frill system that just does the basics straight out of the box and sometimes that's all you need. Not us though. Here are the parts I've gone for for the upgrade. The first is a quad core Ryzen 3 1200 at a cost of £14. I also got another stick of crucial 3200MHz RAM for £14 as well. Finally, it's the 1050 Ti, a small pallet version which cost £42 in an online auction. In total, these components came to £70 and should be enough to transform the gaming experience with this machine, which currently is well, non-existent. The current configuration will start games, but it doesn't seem to want to load them. Again, I can't complain, this is not, nor is it advertised as a gaming machine in any way, shape or form. Fast forward 20 minutes and our A6 had been replaced with the Ryzen 3, the 8 gigs of RAM was now 16 gigs, and the 1050 Ti was just about inside the case. This is very close indeed, but luckily it's a very cool and quiet card that should work fine in this small enclosure. Oh, and did I mention we're running all this on the included 250 watt power supply? 
yeah, I wasn't sure about this, but the 1050Ti doesn't require any external power, and the Ryzen just sips power itself. If I was building a machine like this from scratch, I'd go for at least a 400 watt unit just to be extra safe. But I've read forum posts of people running these cards in 180 watt systems, so I thought I'd just go for it and pray nothing caught fire. Oh, and by the way, the lid closes as well. I, I wasn't sure if the lid would go back on or the side panel would go back on with the 1050 Ti in here, but it does, so that's always handy. <laughs> And look at this, everything works just fine. The Ryzen 3 1200 and 1050 Ti was a glorious budget combination back in the day and you'll find plenty of benchmark videos. These days this pairing is best suited to esports games and older AAA releases. There's nothing quite like spending as little money as possible to have a great time though. But let's talk about the gaming experience. First up here we have Counter-Strike 2 at 1080p with the lowest settings for an average of 83 FPS. There were some little dips and drops here and there with a 1% low of 43 and a 0.1% low of 10, but overall the experience was pretty good considering the price we paid. If you have a little more to spend and we're looking at putting together something similar to this, I'd probably suggest maybe seeing how much Ryzen 5 1400s are uh, instead as you may be able to spend not much more money, yet get better performance from it. In GTA 5 at 1080p with the detail sliders halfway, FXAA, high textures and everything else set to normal with soft shadows and AFX8, we saw 93 FPS overall, which was pretty impressive, I think. The 1% low was 59 and the 0.1% low was 48, so it was a pretty consistent experience overall, though you will notice a little bit of slowdown in those busier and more populated areas with NPCs on screen. Team Fortress 2 is next, 1080p with the lowest settings, 127 FPS on average. Again, there were some problems here with a few dips and drops though. This totally depending on the map we were playing. Overall, I think this was a pretty good result. This result was taken from three online games. The footage you see here is bot footage because I thought I recorded my online games. Turns out I didn't, so I just threw this bot footage up instead. But there we go, Team Fortress 2 runs okay, with a few little hiccups here and there. Apex Legends, however, was really impressive with the high textures, everything else set to lowest and TSAA enabled. Well, this one is clearly more GPU intensive because we saw 97 FPS on average with solid percentile lows. The Ryzen 3, when the action started to heat up, did um, sort of shoot up to 95, 100% utilization in some places, so... It is a limiting factor in some instances, that's fair to say, but overall, it's a nice experience here. And Apex Legends is easily playable on this rig. The same can be said for Minecraft, which at 1080p and the default fast graphics hit over 300 FPS on average. There were a few dips and drops here and there as things loaded in, in the background. For example, as certain things came into view, but overall, yeah, can't complain at this experience at all with this PC. Next up we have Fortnite 1080p with the low preset. We can use the performance mode, but I just stuck with the regular low preset here um, in DX11 mode. Nothing was turned up. FXAA was the form of anti-aliasing and we saw 143 FPS. This smoothed out after a couple of minutes of play and the percentile lows, or especially that 1% low, wasn't too bad at all. As usual with the Fortnite, there was the occasional moment of uh, stutter, but... This was nothing major, and considering the price of these components, I think it was a pretty decent result. These online competitive games like Fortnite, I don't really see the need in turning things up too high. Our 250 watt power supply still hasn't blown up either, which is always good. Um, so it's clearly enough for these gaming upgrades, let alone everyday basic use. It'll be more than fine in that regard. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the final game. Thought I'd push the system a bit here. This is a fairly modern AAA release. 1080p with the high textures. Couldn't choose Ultra because of the 4 gigs of VRAM on the 1050Ti. Not at least from the in-game menu. Everything else was set to low. AF was set to X4. The geometry LOD was set to max. Grass LOD 2 out of 10. TAA medium. And the average frame rate overall was 39 FPS. So considering this runs at 30 FPS, even on the most modern of consoles, I think this is a pretty solid result. And the percentile lows weren't too bad either, but there we go. As I said before, I wouldn't recommend buying a cheap pre-built like this that's not intended for gaming in any way and then upgrading it. I think I'd rather put something together from scratch, but there we are. This just goes to show 
though that if you do have an office system like this, take a closer look at the specs, see what you can upgrade because you never know, you may be able to turn the most basic of systems into something that's pretty capable for very little money. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, leave a like, leave a dislike. If you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.